Good morning. morning. Is it great to have the hymnals back in the pews or what? (laughs) Well, you may also notice that your bulletin is a lot thinner than it normally is because first of all, the music is not there, but the readings are also not there. So the Bibles are in the pews as well. If you have gotten to a place where you've enjoyed reading along with the scriptures as they're being read in service, please make sure you've got that Bible out and ready to roll when it's time to do that. So just wanted you to be prepared for what's coming. So lots of changes today. You know, those are certainly some changes that are happening and we are, as you know, in a time of transition with our leadership here at the church. So if you're wondering what's going on and what's happening in this time, Um, For the next few weeks, there will be a few of us here from the congregation who are clergy, who will be filling the pulpit, leading worship. Uh, um, Me and John Crampton and Cheryl Ann Richards will be providing leadership for you during worship for the next few weeks. Uh, There will be some updates coming from those who are working on various committees to um, have another interim pastor come and be with us as we are some time away yet from having a settled pastor come. And there's some things that need to happen during the interim time that we're still working on. So be prepared, um, listen for those updates as they come. But I know you probably are wondering what's going on. So this is, this is where we are. We are here, we are together, we are in worship, we are a community that supports one another and is here together. If you have pastoral care needs during this time, There are people here who are willing and able to respond to that. So for any pastoral care needs that you might encounter and you need some support, please call the church office uh, during office hours. And Joanne also has made her number available to those of you that might need some assistance. So please don't feel like that has stopped because things are in a time of transition at this particular time. So having said all that, getting all the housekeeping out of the way, Let us worship together this morning. We have a theme, a musical theme that's kind of woven through. I'm not sure it was planned, but we have what wondrous love is this that we're gonna hear a couple times this morning. And what a great theme for our time together because we are together in a place where we are surrounded by and invited into the wondrous love of God. Let us worship together. Please rise as you are able and join me responsibly in the call to worship. Holy One, open us to the movement of your spirit. Holy One, open us to the movement of your spirit. Holy One, open us to the movement of your spirit. Open our hearts to the mirror of wonder. Open our defenses and light us from the darkness. Open our eyes to see your glory. Holy One, open us to the movement of your spirit. And please continue with me for the prayer of invocation. O God of new origins, teach us your ways that we may be open to the same spirit who moved over the face of the waters in the first day of creation and moves also over the chaos of this time. Teach us your ways that we may praise you for all the surprising, ingenious ways you bless us Teach us your ways that we may love the kindness of the prophets and practice it toward the hurting in the world. Teach us, God, we pray. Amen. And this is a new hymn. So for this new hymn, Hannah will play through once so we can enjoy listening to her play. I mean, so that we can listen to the melody before we sing.
Please share the peace of Christ with those around you in whatever way God leads you so to do.
Right. Good morning. Well, I bet everyone up here, and I know everyone out there, knows the golden rule. Does anybody know what the golden rule is? Treat others the way you want to be treated. She said, treat others the way you want to be treated. Exactly. Awesome. I told you guys you knew it. Well, in our book today, we're going to meet Mr. Rabbit. And he's getting some new neighbors. And he with a list of these rules that he wants them to follow. Let's see if they sound like the golden rule. The book's called Do Unto Otters, a book about manners by Lori Keller. And she did a lot of extra drawing in here, which we'll share in Sunday Journeys because I don't have time to do everything she has on these pages, but it's a lot of fun. Doody doo, 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 donk. Hello, Mr. Rabbit. We're your new neighbors, the otters. Otters? Otters? My new neighbors are otters? I don't know anything about otters. What if we don't get along? Rabbit says, pesky otters. And the otters say, lousy rabbit. It's not very nice. Mr. Rabbit, I know an old saying. Do unto otters as you would have otters do unto you. What does that mean? It simply means treat otters the same way you'd like otters to treat you. Treat otters the same way I'd like otters to treat me? Hmm. How would I like otters to treat me? How would I like otters to treat me? Let's find out. Well, I'd like otters to be friendly. Cheerful hello, a nice smile, and good eye contact, all are part of being friendly. Friendliness is very important to me, especially after my last neighbor, Mrs. Grr. <laughs> I'd like otters to be polite. They should know when to say please. Yoo-hoo, Mr. Rabbit, would you please return my ball there? Pretty please, with carrots on top? I can say please in five languages, like Spanish, por favor. Say the magic word and I'll turn these clams into a million dollars. They should know when to say thank you. Dear Mr. Rabbit, thank you very much for returning my ball. You must have returned a lot of balls because you made it look so easy. I can say thank you in five languages, like French, merci. Did you say please or cheese? And they should know when to say excuse me. Excuse me. I can say excuse me in five languages. Excuse away, ime. That's pig Latin. Excuse me for interrupting but... Say please, not cheese. Otters should be honest. That means they should keep their promises. My word is as good as gold fish. Not, not lie. I never lie. It makes my whiskers itch. Not cheat. Cheating makes my whiskers itch, too. Maybe I should call a doctor. I'd like otters to be considerate. You know, being a good listener, asking before borrowing something, not littering, being patient, caring for all creatures, opening the door for someone, 
being on time, respecting the elderly, and helping neighbors untangle ears. It's always good to have a considerate neighbor. It wouldn't hurt otters to be kind. Everyone appreciates a kind act, no matter how bad it smells. Let's give them some fish. Oh, what's that word, cooperate? Otters should learn to cooperate. I see otters like to play. I hope they know how to play fair. Here are the rules for otters' fair play. Be a good sport, play by the rules. Take turns, include everyone, even bees. I hope otters won't tease me about my doody doo my extra large swim fins, and my bad hair days. I hope otters won't tease anyone about anything. Teasing is me. I think otters should apologize when they do something wrong. I'm sorry I used your ear as a tissue. <laughs> and I hope they can be forgiving when I do something wrong. I'm sorry I called you snotter. <laughs> so there, that's how I'd like otters to treat me. You see, Mr. Rabbit, I told you it was simple. Right, just do de doo, -doo unto otters as you would have do de doo, -doo unto wonder which of Mr. Rabbit's rules you like the best. I wonder if you would treat otters this way. I mean others. <laughs> well, I have an otter face for you to remind you how to treat otters, I, I mean others. Okay. And if someone's being mean, I think if you pick up your otter face and put it right in front of you, you'll both end up laughing <laughs> and figure out how to be nice to each other. All right, let's put our right hand and our left hand together. Dear God, thank you for sharing the golden rule with us. Help us to be good followers of your golden rule. of your golden rule. Your golden rule. Amen. Amen. All right, let's head off to Sunday Journey. Please rise as you are able for our centering hymn, Gracious Spirit, Holy Ghost.
scripture reading today, we begin with Genesis chapter 45, verses 3 to 11 and 15, which can be found on page 57 of the Pew Hymnals. Joseph said to his brothers, I'm Joseph. Is my father really still alive? His brothers couldn't respond because they were terrified before him. Joseph said to his brothers, come closer to me. And they moved closer. He said, I'm your brother Joseph, the one you sold to Egypt. Now don't be upset and don't be angry with yourselves that you sold me here. Actually, God sent me before you to save lives. We've already had two years of famine in the land and there are five years left without planting or harvesting. God sent me before you to make sure you'd survive and to rescue your lives in this amazing way. You didn't send me here. It was God who made me a father to Pharaoh, master of his entire household, and ruler of the whole land of Egypt. Hurry, go back to your father. Tell him this is what your son Joseph says. God has made me master of all of Egypt. Come down to me, don't delay. You may live in the land of Goshen, so you will be near me, your children, your grandchildren, your flocks, your herds, and everyone with you. I will support you there, so you, your household, and everyone with you won't starve, since the famine will still last five years. He kissed all of his brothers and wept, embracing them. After that, his brothers were finally able to talk to him. Second reading we have is Luke chapter 6, verses 27 to 38, which can be found on page 1,253. But I say to you who are willing to hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. If someone slaps you on the cheek, offer the other one as well. If someone takes your coat, don't withhold your shirt either. Give it to everyone who asks, and don't demand your things back from those who take them. Treat people in the same way that you want them to treat you. If you love those who love you, why should you be commended? Even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, why should you be commended? Even sinners do that. If you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, why should you be commended? Even sinners lend to sinners, expecting to be paid back in full. Instead, love your enemies, do good, and lend expecting nothing in return. If you do, you will have a great reward. You will be acting the way children of the Most High act. For God is kind to ungrateful and wicked people. Be compassionate, just as your God is compassionate. Don't judge, and you won't be judged. Don't condemn, and you won't be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. A good portion, packed down, firmly shaking and overflowing, will fall into your lap. The portion you give will determine the portion you receive in return. Here ends the reading. Thank you, Carrie, for your leadership this morning and for lending your strong voice for some new songs this morning. Thank you to Janet and Hannah for sharing your passion for music with us this morning. And as always, thank you to Tess and Alex in the back for our tech support and for making this service possible for people who are not here with us in person. So this is not a Catholic church, but I have a confession to make this morning. Are you ready? It could be a fatal flaw for a pastor to say this, but here it is. I don't think the Bible always is truly in touch with and speaks to the reality of our lives. <laughs> Let me say it a different way. 
Some of these texts just miss the mark sometimes. They don't reflect modern times and they don't make sense for us today. Like this text from Luke today. The golden rule, outdated. There should be an updated, edited version of this for 21st century America. I couldn't find one, so I started work on writing one. Would you like to hear it? All right. But I say to you, the great and chosen citizens of the United States of America, love your friends and supporters. Do good to those who love you and do good to you. Bless those who are blessings to you. Pray goodness and God's favor on those who surround you with warmth and comfort. Spend time with your friends and those who understand the world the way you do. Lend freely to those whom you trust and who will respond in like manner. Give to those who will use your resources wisely and not disrespect either you or the means by which you acquired those resources. Love the people who love you and treat you well. Do to others as they have already done to you. But for those who hate you, who treat you badly and steal your resources, give back what you have gotten. Curse those who curse you, or who might be cursing you, but you just aren't sure, but curse them anyway, just in case. If someone speaks badly about you, speak badly about them. If someone strikes you or hurts you, hurt them back. If someone cuts you off in traffic and nearly causes you to wreck, shower them with obscenities and call curses down on their family. If someone begs from you or asks to borrow something you have, ignore them. It's their fault they're in that position anyway. Return wrong for wrong and slight for slight. Do to others as they have already done to you. So what do you think? <laughs> you like it? Well, it has to be an improvement because probably in a lot of circumstances, that's what we actually do. No, not okay? Well, all right, I can see that that last part there about returning wrong for wrong, that part's probably bad. But what about the first part, about loving those who love you back? What's wrong with that? In order to answer that question, maybe we have to start by unpacking what happens to us when we are in a situation of hurt. When we are confronted with people who mistreat us and frustrate us and hurt us and disrespect us, how do we respond? Where do we go in our minds? What do we choose to do? A lot of us likely respond similarly to the Reverend Sharon Betcher in a sermon that she related. Reverend Betcher walks with a cane and she has difficulty moving quickly, especially in crowds. So one day, she relates, in the midst of a busy coffee shop, the manager yelled at her from across the crowded lobby to hurry up and get to the counter to retrieve her order because she's holding everybody else up. And as the crowd parted and she limped to the counter, the manager saw her cane and he saw her limp. Embarrassed, he turned red, apologized, offered to pay for her coffee, helped her to the door. Hurt, she snapped, just let it go. Most people don't even try to apologize and slam the door. For a week, she says, she stewed over the insulting slight and the manager's insensitivity. And then she came to this realization, and I quote, even with the best of intentions, I could not muster in this slight infraction upon my dignity, the simple gesture by which we redeem the hope of human community. Well aware of the gesture that could heal, I nevertheless deliver a backbite of cynicism. I had needed a way beyond my own hurt and instead wound the story around my own wound. I gathered my identity, as so many of us do, from the lot of inhumanity practiced against me. I had wrapped my identity around my hurt." Unquote. 
if we try hard enough and are honest with ourselves, we can see ourselves in there. We see it in our culture all the time. Young men in our streets and women getting shot and killed because one shooting unleashes the retaliation of another shooting and another shooting and another until before long we have a record number of homicides in the city of Columbus. We see it with people of differing opinions shouting each other down over social media or at protests or at school board meetings or in the grocery store. We see drivers reacting to another driver, cutting them off with obscene gestures, curses, and retaliatory driving. We see it with unmasked people railing about mask mandates and those who make them infringing on their rights as citizens while masked people rage about how those without masks don't really care about others at all and aren't listening and what's wrong with them anyway. This is a tough time right now. We are enduring stress at unprecedented levels and at a seemingly unending rate. We are tired and frustrated and worried and exhausted and fed up with being all those things. It makes it easy for us to reach for anger and defensiveness rather than doing unto others what you would have them do unto you. Perhaps that describes you in these times. I know it describes me. Maybe you find yourself responding in anger and defensiveness when you normally wouldn't. Maybe you feel yourself wanting to lash out, to argue, to pay back, even if it's only in your head and you don't actually do it. I like how Reverend Betcher characterized this. We wrap our identities around our hurts. Hurts that are stuck in a reactive cycle looking for some place to land. The revised version of Luke that I read this morning reflects our truth. We have become siloed and increasingly incapable of considering the other. Forget about loving the other, even just seeing and hearing and tolerating has become hard. We're eager to let the fist fly, but we are unable to recall the redemptive gesture of human community. So what's wrong with that, really? Surely the writers of the gospel didn't understand or anticipate what it would be like to live in 21st century America. How could they know? Aren't their words truly outdated for our time? Maybe the gospel writers couldn't foresee what our lives would be like today, but possibly Jesus did have some insight into why these words in Luke 6 are important. First, we know that Returning hurt for hurt doesn't solve anything. Didn't your parents or your mentors or your teachers tell you that two wrongs don't make a right? Or to put it another way, holding a grudge is like drinking poison and expecting the other guy to die. Martin Luther King said it best in his sermon on this text. He said, returning hate for hate multiplies hate and only intensifies the existence of hate and evil in the universe. If I hit you, and you hit me, and I hit you back, and so on, that goes on forever. It never ends." Unquote. Returning hurt for hurt puts us on an endless cycle of hate and violence and misunderstanding that spirals and grows until nothing ever changes and we are so entrenched we convince ourselves that this is morally right. The other problem with returning hurt for hurt is what happens inside of us when we let our anger grow and fester. Consider what anger and defensiveness and retaliation does to us. Science tells us that anger stimulates the hormone cortisol. And if left unmitigated, cortisol will cause all sorts of illness and discomfort. So in essence, our indulgence in anger really does poison us. But in addition, what frame of mind are we in, in that place? 
How does it change how we approach the world, those around us, the situations we encounter? Contrast that state of mind with a text that you heard from this pulpit three weeks ago, 1 Corinthians 13. Now, sometimes it's hard for us to hear that text outside the context of romantic love because that's where we often hear it, right? At weddings. It's pretty standard. At weddings, you hear 1 Corinthians 13. But let's hear it in juxtaposition to Luke 6 and the golden rule. So I'll read a snippet of it. Hear these words again from 1 Corinthians 13. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. This is about an attitude, about a state of mind a decision about how to approach the world in our lives. I don't think that the writer of Corinthians believed for one second that he lived in a fairy tale land where everything was always going to be sunshine and roses and where life was easy. Life is messy and difficult and complicated. There are people who will wrong you and oppose you and frustrate you. Remember, that text in Corinthians was written by Paul the crown prince of difficult people. Remember, before his conversion, he had made it his life's mission to irritate and persecute and make life miserable for everybody. But now he writes this. In his mind, I'm imagining, maybe he was thinking about how to deal with people who are like he used to be. This is a shift in perspective, a decision to be differently. So hear these words again in partnership with our text from this morning. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. May, and I tell you who hear me, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. If someone strikes you on one cheek, turn to them the other also. If someone takes your cloak, do not stop them from taking your tunic. Give to everyone who asks you, and if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Do to others as you would have them do to you. And these words in Luke, to me, are not prescriptions. They are not exactly this is what you have to do when you check the box off when you've completed them all. Rather, they're examples of what love can look like. Love may not look exactly like that to you in your context, in your life, in your situation. So the big question is, how does love look for you? You have to decide that for yourself. Now, I want to tell you honestly how hard this sermon has been for me to write. Because I've been reminded along the way that all these lessons apply to me, too. <laughs> so let me give you an example. It's kind of a trivial example, but it's not so trivial that it doesn't inflame me to anger. <laughs> My wife Angela and I live in an apartment complex where we park in spots parallel next to our neighbors. And one of our neighbors continually parks over the line into Angela's space. So it forces her to park over into my space and me to park over into the neighbor's space and on and on. It happens all the time and it infuriates me. 
What is wrong with this guy? Doesn't he see where he is? Don't you even know how to drive? Where's the consideration of other people? So the other day, he left. And I said to Angela, go out and park over the line into his space. Let's show him what it's like to be inconsiderate and have to figure out where to park. And immediately, it struck me, because I was working on this sermon, <laughs> this isn't love. <laughs> this is defensive retaliation coming from my place of anger and frustration. What would be the result of us doing that? She could do it. I think she entertained it for a minute or two. <laughs> but what would happen? Really, it would force him into the same situation that we are now, figuring out how to park. It would probably make him angry and hurt and frustrated. Would it make him change his behavior in the future? Would it make him park differently? Probably not. It could and possibly might reinforce the cycle of hurt and anger and maybe escalate his actions beyond just parking. The truth is, I don't know why he parks that way. I assume careless in consideration, but what if he can't see well? What if he's afraid of the tight space that's at the end of our lot? What if he just isn't good at parking? So my question for myself is how I can approach this from a place of love rather than from a place of anger. How can I apply this directive of Jesus in my own life? So we come full circle, back to that updated version of the gospel that I led off with this morning. What's wrong with it? Here's Jesus' answer to that question. Jesus calls us to a radical new way of being in relationship. Our current ways are definitely not new, and they're most certainly not radical. They're the easy way out, and Jesus tells us that. Listen, if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. Something has to change in the way that we approach one another in times of hurt. It starts with seeing the humanity of other people, including those we dislike. It starts with asking ourselves, what do they want? What do they fear? Often we see the other as evil, selfish, power hungry, or immoral. Their behavior seems malicious, serving a hidden agenda or seeking to destroy. We think there is no way they could be anything like us in word, thought, or deed. But here's the really tricky part. Others see us in exactly the same ways that we see them. Think about that for a minute. The same attitudes and flaws that we attribute to others, they attribute to us as well. This calls for a radical new way of being in relationship, the radical new way that Jesus implores us to adopt. What if we could see the habit of anger and not other people as our true enemy? What if we could begin to see the other as not all that different from us? What if we could agree and acknowledge that what separates us is not our different positions, but the anger we hold and the way that we see others as less than? It takes time and commitment to step back from our racing thoughts and see them for what they are and where they're taking us. 
It takes time and commitment to replace those thoughts with thoughts of connection and understanding, and yes, even love. To be able to do that, we might be able to make connections and find new ways to create bases of cooperation against our real enemy, our anger itself. What would be the possibility of reward if we commit to doing that? Our Old Testament text for the day provides a glimpse into this radical new way of living. As you remember, this is the tail end of the story involving Joseph and his brothers. And if you're familiar with the story, you might remember that earlier in Genesis, Joseph had been the victim of some terrible behavior at the hands of his brothers. They had first considered killing him, but then they ultimately decided just merely to sell him into slavery. Why? Jealousy. They felt that their father loved Joseph best and favored him. This is a window into the worst of humanity. We would not blame Joseph if he sought ways to destroy his brothers, to take their wealth, even to take their lives as he rose to prominence in Egypt. At the very least, we would have excused him for turning them away when they came seeking help and relief from the famine years later. But he did none of those things. Well, he did toy with them a little bit, when he made them think they were going to be thrown in prison for stealing items from the Pharaoh's court that Joseph himself had planted in their belongings, but nonetheless, his ultimate action with his brothers was to rescue them, to save their lives, to show them mercy. Because of that, they survived the famine and the people of Israel continued on. But more importantly for us, their relationships were healed. Now, don't misunderstand me here. There are times when evil behavior needs to be named, acknowledged, and addressed. Jesus' words in Luke 6 are not a command to be passive in the face of evil or to abandon civil judicial procedures or to ignore protection of basic human rights. But if we can look for a radical new way of being in times of hurt, something good can come from bad rather than more bad from bad. What would have happened if Joseph had given in to his anger and hurt? If he had allowed his brothers and their families to suffer and die as a result of his own hurt, grudge, anger, and desire for retaliation? We would not be reading this book as it's currently written and recorded. We would not have this example of what's possible if we have the courage to embrace a new way of thinking and responding and being. We started off this morning with a facetious rewrite of the golden rule text in Luke 6, but maybe a serious rewrite really is needed, not of the text, but of our, our, our response to it. We may see the text as outdated and impractical and impossible for our times, but Jesus reminds us that great power lies within us to seize a new and radical way of being in relationship, a way built on connection and understanding rather than anger and retaliation. Now, the phrase the golden rule is not actually in this text, but it's a name that's been applied to it from some beginning somewhere. And maybe that's where our rewrite begins, by changing our view of this from a golden rule to a golden opportunity. Let us choose to live into this golden opportunity that God has provided us. Amen. Together in a time of prayer, sharing the prayers of our hearts together, whether we speak them aloud or not. I want to share with you some prayer requests that have been sent to us this week. 
Uh, from Leela Ventling, please continue to keep Judy Rangler in prayers of love, light, and healing as she continues her cancer treatments through next week. From Beth Marler, she sends requests for prayers of thanksgiving and healing for her dear friend Larry, who just received a cancer diagnosis. Uh, prayers for Catherine, who is continuing in rehab and making progress. Prayers for Diane, who is much better, and also prayers for Judy and for Joy. And Bobby Moffitt asks prayers for Beth Rice's sister and her family. You may have seen an email this week about her situation that their landlord has given them a, an eviction notice because he wants to sell the property and they have a very short time to try to find a new place to live. They have five children plus a father and father-in-law living with them and they have three dogs that they're trying to find homes for so that they don't have to go to the shelter. Um, also this morning, I'm sure, Shirley asked me to lift in prayer before you Heather Rodenberg who has blood clots and is dealing with those at this time. So to those prayers, let us add the prayers of our spirits and our souls and let us join together in seeking the presence of God in our midst. God, we come before you asking you to reveal to us that place of wondrous love where we know we can feel your grace and your mercy and your compassion in those moments where we are broken and in those moments where we are hurt and we, where we are frustrated and where, yes, we are angry. We are in times we've never lived through before, God, and we don't know what to do. In these texts that we heard this morning, in these stories of your people that have been passed down for so many generations, God, help us to hear in them your grace. That not every day will be like today. And that if we mess it up today, we have another day coming where we can try again. God, comfort us in our hurts, in our woundedness, in our frustration, guide us to find a path through it with you and with each other. And in the midst of it all, help us to remember to look up long enough to see those places of joy that still are in our world. Thank you for those places where we see hope compassion, love, mercy, goodness, kindness. And with your help, God, may those things be coming from us. For the prayers that we lift to you today, those that have been named out loud, those that are in our hearts, and those that we don't even have words for. Thank you for hearing us, for holding us, for giving us hope, for letting us know that we are not alone. You walk with us every step of our journey. And for that, we give you thanks. Hear us now, God. As we pray together, the prayer that you've taught, taught us to pray. Our mother and father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power 
and the glory forever. Amen. We recognize at this time our receiving of offering. I'm hopeful that as things are starting to change and are being able to have more of our usual things happen that before long we'll be able to pass the plate with one another. But for now, we are still receiving offerings in other ways. So please, if you have offerings that you want to share this morning, please leave those before you exit. And um, please continue to offer your, uh, your gifts in ways that work for you. And uh, now please stand as we share our response together. join me in the prayer of dedication. For gifts given and received, O God, we offer thanks and praise. May we share our abundance with all who have need. May we share our hope in like measure. Amen. Please be seated. And now I invite Lynn to come and share some words of wisdom with us. Good morning, North Church family. Thank you, Heather, for leading us in service today. Um, what a timely and wonderful message you gave us. Um, I, when I decided to, or said yes to be moderator this year, my biggest fear was this, <laughs> doing the announcements on Sunday. So I need support, and so today, Dave Meashear, our friend, um, will be also helping with the announcements. So, all right, Dave. Good morning. Uh, there's a Bread Justice Ministry Network meeting today at 12.30 on Zoom. Uh, if you'd like to join us but you don't have the link, uh, talk to me after the service. Uh, the Caring Ministries team will meet Tuesday evening at 6.30 in the Fellowship Hall. Webs will meet Wednesday at 7 p.m. on Zoom. Uh, Bible study will be led by Reverend Dr. Robin knows Wallace on Friday morning at 10.30 on Zoom. Also, Reverend knows Wallace will lead the Ash Wednesday service of Ashes and Meditation on March the 2nd at 6.30. And there will be a congregational meeting on March the 13th right after this service to present a selection of a, an interim pastor and hold a congressional vote. That's all we have for today. Just one more. Um, sorry, Dave. Um, so Joanne Nay is offering a, um, through the UCC denomination, um, a daily devotional. Um, it's called The Long Haul, I believe, which sounds pretty appropriate for these times. So if you'd like to participate in the daily devotional um, that Joanne's offering, please let her know today. You can either, either get that by PDF, um, download or uh, paper copies. So let her know today. I think it would be kind of nice if we all kind of share in our in a daily devotional. So, all right, well, have a good week. Okay, as you are able and willing, please stand and we will sing our, our ascending hymn number 314.
Well, in my remarks before my sermon, I forgot to thank Dee for that wonderful book because I don't know about you, but I'm going to have a hard time now not thinking about do unto others, to do unto otters as you would have otters do unto you. <laughs> we have a difficult task, and that is to live in love. It's not easy. No one ever said it was going to be. But the beauty and the grace of this text and the message for today is that there is grace. We're going to mess it up. We're going to stumble. We're going to not live into what we're capable of. But we have another day. And we have God with us. And we have each other. Figuring it out all along the way. So, as we leave today, continue being open to that place where God is calling your name into a place of greater love, of greater connection, of greater human community. Amen. Amen.